Welcome everybody, I'm very excited to be with you today and I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nations on whose land Monash University operates. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. You may be based elsewhere, so we pay respects to traditional owners of the land from wherever you may join us. We are meeting today via Zoom from three separate locations. I'm uh, in my home and um, working from home at this particular time. And um, I'll ask the other guys when they come to just talk a little bit about their location. Um, it's, a it's a very great pleasure to introduce our panel for this MAMA event, Make Conversation, which is one of the Formex content series of talks presented by Monash University, Department of Design. I'm Ian Wong and I'm a senior lecturer in design at Monash University and a curator of exhibitions, particularly associated with design, which is very relevant for what we're doing here today. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our guests, um, Dr. Denise Whitehouse and Vishnu Bradar. So Vishnu, if I could just ask you to just say a bit about yourself, you're in New York. Uh, it's wonderful to uh, be talking to you from New York and just ask you to talk about yourself and then I'll ask the same of Denise and then we'll start with the actual conversation. Uh, just in terms of, well, hello everyone, just in terms of specific location, I am about uh, three blocks away from the Metropolitan Museum on the uh, east side of Manhattan and uh, I have been here about uh, 23 years. Uh, left uh, St Kilda and came here 23 years ago. I'm a, a creative director with uh, my own firm here in New York and happy to be here to talk about that with you. Um, I, I'm Denise Whitehouse and I am in Croydon, Victoria, um, um, where, where many years ago I I taught Vishnu at Swinburne University when we were on the Hawthorne campus. Um, I am a, in those days, I was a lecturer in design history at Swinburne, and um, which was very challenging and incredibly wonderful to do. Today, I am a writer and an author, and I have, um, and particularly an expert on Grant Featherston, the furniture designer. And at the moment I'm working on John Truscott, the stage and film designer from Melbourne, who was rare in having achieved two Oscars for one film, but he was an amazing man that impacted on the lives of everybody he met. And he had the gift to be able to change two cities through festivals and events and he changed Brisbane and he changed Melbourne. And there are very rare people that have those abilities, those creative design abilities. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So we're coming to you from different parts of the world and we've got different perspectives and we really do hope that this session is one of rich conversation uh, and in particular talk about connection. You know, we, we have had a period of time over the last couple of years with the pandemic where you know, our one-on-one -on -one interactions, the hugging of each other and those really warm celebrations that are very meaningful to us all are challenged. And um, I'd like to begin our conversation today by asking Vishnu, who two years ago, and it's almost two years ago, you know, very much at this time of the year, um, Italy was first impacted and then New York was very, very um, much impacted by the pandemic. And I, I hope, Vishnu, you can take us back to that time mm -hmm. and the challenges it presented, and then we can lead on from there. So if you just take us back two years mm -hmm. to how crazy it was in New York and the challenges that were there. Yes, I can take you back to March the 17th, exactly. And uh, typically we, my family, I have a, a husband and, and a 10-year-old boy, son, uh, we go to Shelter Island on weekends to uh, find wonderful time in nature and we left that weekend and that was the weekend that we heard you know what was going on and basically we didn't leave Shelter Island for about I would say almost a year 
you know, eight, eight months to a year. So it was, it was a long time. And um, well, like, like all of us who went through, you know, the, the shock and the, the horror of it all, um, we quickly understood how serious it was. And um, I guess in terms of, if I jump straight into, in terms of, you know, our business, my, my, you know, our business here, it was, things came to a standstill. And, you know, I would say for months, people really didn't emerge. And so we kind of went into this um, very unusual place where we kind of, you know, didn't know what would happen and kind of day by day dealt with this kind of unknown, um, especially as things, things got very quick, very quickly turned bad. You know, you would see the, um, you know, you would see in, in, in the Javits Centre and in Central Park, the, the, you know, the hospitals that were set up in, in you know, in daylight. And um, it was, it was, it was just, you know, unspeakably awful. Um, so, of course, my thoughts turned to Australia and, um, you know, obviously where I was born and um, to, to friends there, because obviously we were all reaching out to everybody, making sure everybody was okay. And so, of course, I reached out to Denise. Um, and, and uh, you know, my family in Australia, but Denise specifically, because we had, we have, you know, maintained a very long relationship since I met her in uh, 1988, which is um, close to 35 years now, which is a while. Um, so our, our, I must say that, you know, our dialogues began then, um, kind of on a very frequent basis, Denise. And... Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to chime in now. Yeah, no, it, it did about there. And I mean, for me, I can remember that weekend because of, that we in Melbourne went into lockdown because I had been interviewing people on the Thursday and I was chasing down an international person who had worked with Barry Kosky, the opera designer, and he had to flee Melbourne, so I didn't get him. But then everything closed down and that meant I could not work in archives, I couldn't do my research in those things. But online research became really important in that time and it also in talking to people. So Vishnu, I mean, I was talking to people internationally online, but then Vishnu um, reached out and we started to talk just to one another and we were sharing these experiences while talking about things like our creativity and what we were trying to do at the same at the same time, um, so it, it was supporting a supportive relationship that we had, which is, and it renewed the one that started in, as Vision has said, in 1988 when I arrived at Swinburne, um, wet behind the ears to teach design students about their history, which was and to encounter Vision, who was. Um, had a determination and a um, talent that was unrivaled in at that time and a determination that was wonderful as she knew where she was going. There's a, a strength in Vishna, which I believe comes from her Croatian upbringing. Um, then, and she can tell you stories about how she had to perform as a child. Um, and I'll leave them for her to tell. But she has this strength and this determination and she was always determined to go off out of Australia to, to encounter the big world and to, to work there. That was what she wanted. One yeah. thing I'd like to comment there oh, is yeah, go on, what's joyous about today is that we're actually talking about beginnings of both people really Denise yeah. in terms of you, you you talk very warmly about arriving at Swinburne and 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 beginning your very distinguished career and we have Vishna who grew up in Geelong decided that you know to study design but not just to study design anywhere that you know for, right. for, yeah. for Vishna it was she wanted to study at the best and the best at that time and I, I used to go to the open days. I used to, you know, uh, uh, go to all those places. And I was told when I was on work experience that Jay Walter Thompson, this country kid um, in the city, in a multi-storey building, I'd never been in a place with a lift, Swinburne's the place. You've got to go there. Bob Francis and all the people there and all the wonderful stuff. So it had an incredible reputation. 
It, and I think it speaks very highly of Visioner's Drive that at a time when you had to be interviewed and the whole process was very formal, um, you know, you had to be very, very good to get in. And obviously Visioner, as you've already said, Denise, was an outstanding student. Yeah, Ian, I also, you know, if we're talking connections, I mean, it's when I first met you because you had connections into Swinburne. Um, so, but Swinburne was, um, and of course, Visioner um, challenged everybody who taught her and took everything that she could, that she could learn from people. And she was, um, and I think a, a sense of that she was going to go somewhere was the final exhibition in which she took her piece of graphic design and converted it into a very, very beautiful um, chaise lounge type of, is that, that's right, or was it a chair, V? Um, no, it was yeah, like a uh, yeah, a, a type of chaise lounge, and it was yellow, and it was startlingly, you know, at, and it, it it was the star of the show basically. Um, and of course, it, she her career took took off after that because there were many people looking to employ her. But if I am right, it, she was determined to go it alone and to go overseas very very quickly. Feed. <laughs> well. <laughs> I, I would say for um, for me it was important to uh, forever question. You see, and and I, w I was never never happy that um, I was kind of restricted to the to this two dimensional, and that was why I was completely interested in architecture and sculpture and saw no reason why I couldn't design a piece of furniture for you know my personal you know fourth year project honors honors project. So I guess in a way it looked to the to the outside world it looked like I was being disruptive, which in a way I was. I was challenging the status quo. I and I kind of really enjoyed that. Um, so for me it was um, in, instead of kind of going down the easy pathway of of taking you know full time position somewhere. To me it was just far more interesting to see what I could do on my own. And that basically entailed, you know, just going into the unknown. And I kind of seemed to be comfortable with that uncomfortable notion. And I think that's kind of been something that stayed with me the whole time, this idea of being somehow comfortable with the fear, okay, comfortable with the risk taking and just seeing what I could do on my own, which I think is far more interesting than when you have to go and, and kind of work for someone else where you're told what to do. And I was never good at kind of being you know, a good girl like that and being you know, told what to do. So um, yeah, if, I, if I can just give a bit of context for people, um, you know, at the time Swinburne had this extraordinary international, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, intern program, you know, so uh, IBL year. And you had to be the best to get into IBL and Vision obviously clearly was, and so therefore she got that opportunity. But the normal track and the traditional track, it's a very successful track for Swinburne and for, for the people in graphic design, was to get an opportunity to work in one of the amazing studios that were around at the time, the bigger practices, and then to go on that track and to work for those people. And, and you did absolutely, you know, you had all the offers in the world, Vision. You know, everybody wanted you to work with them, but no there was a different track and you've described that. And I think it's important to bring people to recognise um, that time in Melbourne and, and all the opportunities. But as Denise has said, you know, you, you were seeking other opportunities. Well, I, again, Ian, just to, in terms of, I'm not sure if I was, yes, seeking other opportunities as, as more to, to be focused on. I was more interested in the ideas I could come up with on my own. Right. So therefore, if you're in, you know, if you're in a, your studio and you don't have one project on your desk, nor do you have a client, what do you do? And I was interested in those questions. How do you shape your life? What are the, what are the, who, who do you call? To work, who do you speak to? So therefore you have to go inside and really look at what moves you. Why does it move you? Who do you want to work with? Why? And I think that kind of digging down 
kind of served me well because I always pursued pretty authentically a, a pure path in a way. And a pure path meaning I always listened. I always listened to what, what moved me. And, and that was, you know, that was my pathway. I think that might be a really lovely segue to something which we've talked about and we can share. You were listening one day when Denise was talking about some of the famous people from around the world, maybe Denise or, you know, we can talk about that. I, I think that we, um, one of the, the wonderful things about Swinburne at that time was just the sheer confidence that its students could go out. And we, those of us educating, and there were a wonderful group of people educating. She, she was with the best you could get at that time. But we were looking all the time outwards and telling and getting students to believe that they could go out and function in the world. And it's a golden moment in design. You've, um, you've uh, got Neville Brody with the Face magazine and it was so exciting. You've got Memphis and, and Sotsas and the postmodernist shift. And we were exploring those things. And Vishna will now tell you what she found in her diary her, so, um, from recently, which is good. Here is my uh, diary from my first year at Swinburne, 1988, a, a Collins diary. Um, and inside, what I found was here at the bottom on the uh, Thursday, the 28th of April, there you will see that I did um, a history tutorial presentation on Memphis, which uh, I was presenting to Denise and my class at the time. We did, we, one of the things within the history was that you didn't just sit there because design students need designers need presentation skills. So we did a hell of a lot of presentations and they were enormous good fun. But that was, um, I think, you know, this is our segue for Visioner heading off around the world because I also have letters from Visioner and postcards from Visioner on the night before she went to um, try and get to, to, to um, go to Memphis studio and talk to Sotsas and see if he would employ her. So I think she can tell us. And she talked in that letter about her, her, um, her you know, the, the letter has all the intensity of what she was just talking about, of facing the fears, of being bold, brave, going out there, the courage that she had. So, V, why did you head off? Um, why did I head Europe? off? Well, okay. So, uh, or when? I, I, I was, well, why is I was always soon, very quickly, you know, once I started the education with you and at Swinburne, I was very, very fascinated by the new, the idea of the new. And Memphis was radically the new, okay? So here we are in 1988 and I am like basically devouring the whole Swinburne library, trying to read everything I can get my hands on. And I discover a marvellous bookstore on Flinders Lane, which I believe is no longer there. It was an architecture store. And here is where I will show you now um, the uh, magazines that were produced by Sotsas' studio called um, Terrazzo Magazine. Okay. And so, again, this is 1988. So we're right. This is the first edition. And I see in the foreword here, in the editor's note, I see two sentences that I underlined. And those sentences are, to create new ties and friendships, to exchange ideas and enthusiasm. So I think that was important. The fact that you could be on this search, this discovery of the new and, and all the people that represented the new. So, you know, to, to go back, you know, Chris Connell was one of the first people I worked with. Okay, he for me it was you know the new. He was he had big cultural impact in Melbourne. Um, I spent about a year working with great people in in in, in Melbourne who really enabled my creativity. Uh, people like Jenny Bannister, Wendy Bannister, Scanlon, um, you know many, many people. And then I quickly went overseas. 
Um, and we can jump to success, but before success, I must say that I did go to Paris and there was Mark Newson. But we can come back to Mark and, and you know. Go, in, go there now. We, well, uh, because we're talking about the new and I think Memphis was really the bold new, okay? And, you know, I, I remember uh, just thinking that, you know, they did have a big interest in graphics and I did meet with Ettore and, you know, it did take probably maybe five weeks. So you have to understand that, like, you know, you get you you reach out to the studio and they say, no, come, you know, it's not available. You know, it's like patience. How much patience do you have? How much willpower do you have to stay with it and not go to another city? Because, OK, it didn't work out in the first week that you wanted it to work out. So... It was kind of like persistence. And then eventually I did, I did meet him in a very dark room where it was just me and him. And it was extremely uh, marvellous and mysterious and kind of spiritual where really all he cared about were the things that moved me. I mean, he looked at the portfolio and he was, you know, you know I think he wanted to give me a job, but they just didn't have any, any offerings. But... Um, he just cared about what moved you. And, you know, in fact, that's really, I think the thing that's key in any kind of creative career is like what moves, what moves you and, and, and staying true to that. Um, I mean, what, 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 what's I think interesting about that, just in terms of our own lives is that sometimes the, the people that you hold up, they disappoint, you know, and I hear, I'm hearing in the way you're describing that encounter as the opposite, you know, like it was a, a terrific exchange and, and a meaningful thing and you've your patience paid off in that sense yes it, it is very much Vishnu that thing of if you can meet people that then as you say inspire lift um, and can lift you up and I think we all need to meet people like that along the way or to seek them out as you actively did yeah so so what tell us about that location where was that Oh, Where somewhere we, in, in somewhere in Milan, in Brera. Um, well, was, well, just be fair, Viz. Like you, you know Milan like the back of your hand. But a lot of the people watching this don't have any idea. So you mean, give us you a, mean bit, in give terms us a of, bit more of joy about being in Milan at that time. Well, if okay, so I, I did locate the business card from my oh, meeting. Fantastic. Fantastic. So I, <laughs> Clearly, I'm, this is that number nine via Borgo Novo. So, um, well, as someone passionate about history and about artifacts, I have to say I'm going to enjoy this conversation. So, okay. um, so, oh, look, I, I, I think in a way it was probably like a not a big deal of an office. It's not, you have to realize Memphis is not corporate. So you're not walking into an office with 50 people, right? You're walking into an office probably where there were 12 people. And, you know, I ended up meeting Aldo Shibich, who was one of the founding members who, you know, I have his card here too. And he eventually, you know, we, we all became friends. He was the one who ended up, you know, kind of feeling a little sorry that I couldn't get a job with success because he wanted me to because he saw my passion and desire and so he had a friend called Tibor Kalman, who was in Rome at the time, the great American, you know, bad boy of design, Tibor Kalman, who was living in Rome, uh, had actually relocated from New York to Rome, uh, uh, let go of his office to work for Colors magazine, which was a Benetton magazine. And so that's where I ended up landing. So it's a, it was a marvelous segue. I mean, you have to really say that, you know, the pathways are perfect, even when they don't work out how you want them. You really have to believe that they take you down this magnificent other pathway that serves you in many other ways. What about the pathway to Paris? Well, the pathway to Paris was direct from the first time from Melbourne going to Europe. Um, I had a, a, a friend who introduced well, who gave me the phone number of Mark Newson. And when I got to Paris, I, of course, you know, knocked on his door. He had, um, and I, it's, it was in the second arrondissement um, in a kind of like the sewing district. 
and he had um, a project where he had someone who was doing a brochure for him, but he saw my folio and um, he said, would I take on a project for him? And I did. I, I kind of ended up, you know, taking on the brief and kind of I, I feel like with that project, what he asked for is not what he got. And I think that's the one of the things I try to do with all my projects is someone tells you they want X and you give them something way more than X. It should always be more. Newsom was just starting out at that stage. He was just, just for um, having not long left Australia, is that right? And he was famous for his shows. Yeah. Denise, I think he was about 30 and I was probably 23. Yeah. And yeah. he, I think he did, he was in Tokyo and he was in Japan for a, for a few yeah. years. So I think he was really up and coming. And yeah. Yeah. one of yeah. the projects I did for him was um, the invitation to his Milan, his first solo show at the Milan Furniture Fair. Um, but uh, I, I will show you the, the, the brochure, which ended up becoming basically an art object, which was... I said to him it needed to be just a compilation of everything he'd ever designed as well as process. And I wanted to document and celebrate process because obviously his process is so, you know, the handwork and the hand, the hand was so critical. Um, so I, I guess at this point, let me, let me show you the object which I have here. So um, this is the piece which, uh, uh, as you can see, has... Uh, no name, no picture of Mark. It really, uh, my goal was to just distill it into Mark's language. So um, this object basically comes out of this sleeve and um, basically doesn't, is not read left to right, is read top to bottom. And um, if I uh, open it up. Let's see where we land. If I can even, it's pretty heavy. Um, oh, it is a good place to open. No, let me see. Let me see what I can. Um... And just while Vision's doing that, everybody, I just would very much like to share with you the fact that um, the the uh, exhibition that I'm currently doing as part of Design Week, which hopefully some of you may get along to, and Visioner is coming out to Australia to attend. Um, she won an award. She won a major award in that for a famous book. But before that, she won an award for two years in a row for this work at Newsom. So it's very significant in terms of historic history of Melbourne design as well. So, Mr. Sorry, please, please, that's the Lockheed Lounge. Don't put it down. <laughs> yes, it's, um, it's uh, you know, the intention was to you read it this way because the text was here. And I, I wanted to kind of pretty much break every rule in, in the book shall I say, um, um, and then the spiral in the center and the way that you break up the imagery because you're not supposed to do that. And the spiral in a way is another one of uh, Mark's um, forms of language in a way. He, the spiral appears in, in furniture. And um, if, you go, if you go through this, there's so many images that are just, you know, again, let me see what we have here. Um, and the construction of this was everything was done by hand, I, I want to say. So basically what we did, what I did was um, I had a photographer uh, print these images to the scale I needed them to be printed. Um, and then I cut them out by hand and then we um, put them onto this, the size of this board. And these are basically photocopied pieces. This is not even printed um, by a printer because we only made a handful of them. Um, so maybe one other thing I can show you is the, this um, kind of disturbing, I, I love this, this, this disturbing sense of scale, whereas this is a, a, a watch, okay? But the, the idea of turning it into like a monumental, you know, almost like a piece of architecture, I thought was quite thrilling. Um, so that, that's basically, you know, there's a great many pages in here to, to discover. So, Ian, when, when you get it at your show, you can open it up at any page you want. Yeah, no, it, it's a very exciting artifact. And I, and I, and I think also it not only talks about your practice, because, you know, with a lot of joy, I've been watching you talk about 
the different aspects and the production techniques at the time. But uh, Denise, I'm, I'm fascinated by you know what you know, what influenced uh, um, Visioner. You know, like talk about maybe you know the power that I can see in that work for someone so young. You know, like it seems extraordinary to me. I think, look, it was in someone so young. But it also was, you know, historically, it was a moment when young designers were and uh, pushing the boundaries. It was the shift. Um, ultimately, it would link in with computers. But as I said before, you had somebody like Neville Brody changing the whole language of magazines, changing the whole way we read typography. There were um, there was a greater interest in um, a. a a move away from the modernist um, language, which we, particularly of graphic design, into being much more experiment, experimental. So it, it's those ways. I also think that with Vishnu and with others was, you know, looking at art and seeing graphic design as an art form, not just as a commercial service. You know, there's that notion that the role of the designer is the service of industry. Whereas this was a moment and it was where it was very much about, no, designers have responsibility to their profession, to their art form and to push it and explore things like form and content, which Visioner is doing there, to actually understand what the language of graphic design is about, what its heritage is about. So, you know, she looks at Memphis, but she also told us how she found um, her referencing of Malevich, the constructivist um, artist slash designer, and his exploration of, of the square, of, you know, that, that type of, of the, the graphic, of the, sorry, it's not the graphic form, it's our primary form, so to speak. So the triangle, the circle, mm -hmm. the square. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those things are there, of viewing graphic design as an art, as a graphic form that ha that is really important in shaping our worlds, and therefore we should treat it um, really honourable, honourably, and push it, push it all the time, because it should always be pushing forward and developing. She. Well, let, let me while you're speaking about the black square. So, yeah. Um, here. I mean, we here Sorry, is the, um, I don't know if you can all see that, but here is the, the Chris Connell business card where you in fact have a square within a square. So there is the square in the center where the eye is drawn, where MAP, the letters MAP, Merchants of Australian Products is. And then, you know, again, for me, the, the, the wonderful thing here is that it's within a transparent square and we're not using paper. We're looking at other materials. We're not sticking to the traditional shape of a, of a business card. We're doing everything but, and I think that's what mission, that's the mission I was on from day one, mm. kind of just pulling things apart all the time and seeing how you could do things in, in a fresh and new way, yeah. really. And, and, and I, I, I think the, the connection that you both have, you know, the, 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 the long-standing discussions that you've had over the years, you know, you can see there's a central sort of notion about the, the way you see things. Can you take us to New York in the millennium? There was an interesting change, an interesting time. We had, you know, we had the, 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 yeah, the whole that whole time. Maybe share share that time. We, my family, my you know, we took the children. They went children. They were you know young adults. We all went to New York for the. Um, well, we wanted to go to New York, so we went for four weeks and the millennium was at that time. And Visioner had just moved to New York on the basis of having, she had won the Victorian Design Award and that had given her enough money to head to New York where she was out to work with Fabian Barron 
to you know set up her career and the money from the my memory and vision do correct me um my memory was that that money enabled her to be able to get a, a flat an apartment because you had to pay people to get the apartment for you mm -hmm. so we met and i remember that Vishnu and i would go off and we were we tracked down fame a famous cafe on the west side of new york where the graphics had been done by Tibor Kelman. And, you know, and what was radical about those graphics was that he took this, and it was the, the era of the vernacular in, in um, typography and design. And so he took the, um, they were the type of stuff you bought in the news agents, and it was a, a, a form, a, a padded form, and you stuck the plastic letters into it. And and made and that's how he would made the men you know, put the menu sign made the graphics so it was very radical and the two of us had to go up there and have a coffee and find the you know the business cards for it but we also went to see the Mizzy, Izzy Miyake exhibition which which was just gobsmacking so we were looking sharing sharing those things and Vishnu was in the process of setting off on this career in New York and and, and yet that was big because New York is a tough place. Over to you. Well, you know, yes, I, I had the, the the few years with Fabian Barron, but since and then after that, obviously, I, I set up my own uh, studio here. But um, since you're talking about Issey Miyake, I will. I wanted to share with you um, a, I guess, a, a, a book that I did for Issey, or rather, they called it a magazine at the time. But um, Yes, you're probably just seeing a white piece of paper. It is not. Let me first show you the one. This was edition two. Let me show you edition one that was done by Neville Brody, the man that um, Denise just mentioned, who was doing the face magazine. So I, I guess you couldn't imagine two more uh, uh, opposite uh, approaches to this magazine uh, where, you know, I guess Neville was going uh, extremely colourful, maximalist, um, you know, and, uh, over the top. Um, yeah. And I, my approach was, um, and I, perhaps you can see the Isimiyaki in the, in the bottom, yeah, pr barely printed, um, barely printed. And it says um, Isimiyaki Tribeca, which is where uh, the, 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 the new store was. And I guess it also says, um, yeah, 2003. So what, what is this? Why, why does it look like a white piece of paper or, or, you know, you could argue a piece of, you know, a white conceptual piece of art, like a white canvas that, you know, the conceptual artists were doing in the 60s and 70s. So when you open it, you know, my goal was to use the thinnest, print on the thinnest paper I could find, number one. So A, make it very uh, fragile. I, I like the idea of fragility in design. Um, I like that things are difficult to print. So for example, this is this is a book that's actually um, constructed in a way that Isimiyaki's dresses are constructed. And I think that is marvelous with, with this project. So if you can see everything, you know, his, his, his dresses are pleats. So everything here is, I mean, I, I'll, I'll pull this apart for you just to kind of entertain you for a moment, but um, you know, you'll see that. Um, <laughs> Oh, vision. Yeah. That's wonderful. It's a, it's a, it's an ongoing it's extraordinary. Um, that's what it is. It, it no, really it, is. It, it's, it's an ongoing such... pleat, pleat of um. But the book is still there at the base. It's attached. So if we go oh, back oh, that down, is, that holds, is fantastic. It, it holds perfectly, and and you know, I, I must say, I drove many many people insane during the process. Which again, <laughs> it is another delightful thing. You, you, um, you've you've never done. I'm sure you've never ever done that before no, in your life. She, never, no, no, never, never. Well, I think then, again. It, yes. No, I was going to say to you. I think the thing that's striking there is, you know, Brody was about breaking boundaries, but there's a real difference in that. I think you as he was breaking boundaries about print, whereas you're thinking really carefully about your client and how to communicate what your clients' values are, and also their, um, their sense of form, their, their, you know, what it is that they do. I and mean, then you really capture um, Ms. Izzyniaki's method there, which is, yeah. Well, I, oh, it's 
it's, it's a strange duality that I'm working with all the time. This idea that I, I, I want to create an object that I love, that is expressive of me as an artist, but at the same time, you must fulfill, you know, the, the project at hand, which you are, I hate to work, use the word service because I actually never feel that I'm at the service of anybody. I always feel like that there is this ability to take that brief and kind of turn it into an artistic object. I think that's, that's always been my point. And to bring sculpture to it, to mm. bring mm. architecture to it, to deal with the touch, to deal with... Um, to deal with all those visceral things that make it a, a delight and a surprise. And even if it can be strange, that's a good thing because strangeness makes people look and you want people to look. Otherwise, it's just all bland and everything, you know. So, do you ever, you know, want, to, do you ever want to shock? Is oh, I love that. Yes. But look, I'm shocking with the most calm thing you can, it's so calm and quiet. That's the wonder here. It's just this so many dualities going on. We're shocking with the white page, you know, mm -hmm. and with um, with and simplicity. The size, of, the size of that print looks incredible. And the way that it's on, on the edge. I love the yeah. edge. Mm -hmm. You know, being on the edge is a marvellous place to be. So we we'll, put type on the edge a lot. We'll, we'll, we'll probably start to run out of time and it's been joyous, but um, perhaps the, the new food book, just to share that bright red sure. product with us sure. and maybe SSS you might want to comment about Denise I know you're yeah, very yeah. positive about it yeah so here, here this was a cookbook designed for um Jill Duplay who is our incredibly talented Australian you know chef food critic writer um extraordinaire and so I have to say that at the time though you know cookbooks looked nothing like this Okay, cook, cookbooks were just a very, I would say, boring category. And I, I just, I, I thought, you know, with someone like Jill, um, you know, she, well, first of all, I wanted it to stand out in, on the bookshelves. She wore red lipstick all the time. And it was a moment where I hated the excess of things, the visual excess. And so I went for a very kind of pure, shocking, simple um, cookbook cover, which was extremely unusual at the time. Um, and then inside, basically, you, um, there's, a, there's, again, you will see that kind of same treatment of type where we're kind of at the, at the edge, we're starting at the top and we're at the edge, but there's only one font size used from the beginning to the end here. So there's this type of extremely reductive uh, approach, which for me was, I, I was fascinated by that. I was so interested in how much could you do with very little? Um, so that's going to be, um, Ian, that's going to be on display. Absolutely. And like I said, that's the thing that gave you the opportunity, the, the money that you won by the your peers recognising, you know, because that's another thing about the awards, you know, the, the award structure is from your peers, you know, and they, uh, for a very young person, gave you this wonderful accolade and, and um it's joyous to sit here and to look at what has been the outcome of that peer review and that, you know, that opportunity that, that uh, you were presented with. Yeah, Kate, Ian, I'm not sure what time we have, but we haven't talked about Vishnu's um, work at the moment. And I mean, she's wearing that brooch that she's wearing and that if we could see really close up is sparkling diamonds and the ring is sparkling <laughs> diamonds. And these are Vishnu's part of Vishnu's jewellery collection, which are just, you know, exquisitely made. But then there's this incredible body of work that she has got, that she has built up. And v, do you have any, can you tell us about your, you know, the clients that you had after Baron, the work that you have been doing now? Well, uh, look, after, after Baron, there were some highlights where um, I did a photo shoot with uh, Dick Avedon, Richard Avedon, before he passed away where we worked um, for Bill Blass. And um, we probably don't have time to look at some of those images, but maybe I can grab one. Um, and this is, um, this was um, a, a four page, um, a four page. Well, we, we selected characters from New York City and um, they were all a little 
Um, very interesting. Uh, yeah. um, we had two, two men, two women, and um, but what, I think what was interesting here was the copywriting where it said it isn't expected, it's Bill Blass, because Bill Blass at the time in the, I guess it was 70s, 80s, was really also groundbreaking. Um, and we said it isn't obvious, it's Bill Blass, it isn't for everybody, it's Bill Blass, and um, it isn't a trend. But to work with Dick Avedon, of course, you know, what, what can I say? Um, let me show you uh, perhaps the, um, the jewellery packaging um, that, you know, I, I create um, my fine jewellery. And um, I always thought it was kind of ridiculous that you would, you know, go to these large kind of corporate jewellers and, you know, the big ones, and you would buy a jewel and it would come in a cardboard box even though you may have spent a million, $2 million, you would get a car. So this um, is a carved piece of um, see-through uh, material where um, the jewels come in their pouches, if you can see. And, um, but basically you can see them, you can view them. They're in a piece of sculpture. It's almost like a, an ice cube. But um, again, you'll see there's a square pouch and then you'll also see that there's a square within the square. So this, the square keeps coming back to me. Um, perhaps I can kind of talk a little bit about how um, my, uh, I said, my graphic design and creative direction informed the jewellery. So, for example, let's say, you know, I, there was no jewellery I wanted to wear. I never even wore jewellery. So, for, you know, I was doing a project with Van, Van Cleef and our pal, and I started to realise that, you know, most of that type of jewellery I would never wear. So I thought, well, I started to think, what would I wear? So it, the project just started like that. And um, I, I go with, I went freely with the idea and designed things that moved me. So when I say things, I, I'll take that back. I'll say I was interested in themes that moved me. So number one, the idea of freedom, which has been with me since I was born, I guess. And that's why I have, this is the freedom piece and it's, you know, an abstracted piece of pair of wings. Um, I, I, when I wear these pieces, I'm reminded of that as, as a virtue, as a feeling. Um, if I go into a meeting and I put that on, it just, it, it really takes me to another place. So they're very emotional pieces. They're, they're a, a place for me to be sculptural and kind of um, purely artistic. And also they're, what, what the strange thing is that, you know, I'm doing product design essentially with this, but these are very flat. I never do three dimensional jewelry. <laughs> they're two dimensional. So with the two dimensional work, I try to be three dimensional, but with this, I, I, I stick to pure line. The, I, when I see your contemporary work, mm -hmm. um, I'm always blown away that it's just so amazing. So that's why I'm going to say, can we see, have you got something else? Your, your um, work for New York developers. I mean, your contemporary clients are, yes. have been at yes. the top, very top of, um, of New York developers. Um, one dealing with a... Um, development by Norman Foster, the, the um, British architect, leading British architect, world famous. So can we? Yes. So with, with, yes, Denise, thank you. So with the recent project, like the Norman Foster project, which was um, uh, a building right opposite the United Nations, where uh, it was a residential building with 50 um, residences and Norman Foster designed it. Um, in fact, and we basically worked on this project for about four or five years, which is a, it's a very long time. And so in terms of scope, I'll tell you that that started with, well, in fact, we did take over from a very large New York creative agency and the client was not happy. And um, we took over and immediately started creating a video for them that um, was given to potential, um, you know, consumers, customers who would live in that building. But we really, the amount of work that was done there that, you know, you don't, I, I can't even show you, I'll show you one, one aspect of that. But we did all, all communications. We did multiple advertising campaigns. We did printed uh, brochures. We did um, 
special events for them. We did, I mean, it's just a, a, a vast amount of work, but what we know is that the work that we did helped sell. And, you know, you know, we, our work is in, we're in the business of selling. And yeah. in this case, in some projects more than others, in this case, it's a high, it's a, how can I say, it's a high risk work. You want to make sure that you're hitting the solution and that you're helping this client sell when we're dealing with a billion dollars worth of property. That is what our graphics had to sell, okay? So it's a pretty significant undertaking to make sure that you communicate, A, artfully, always the way that I'm proud of my work, that it's artful, but B, that it meets their, de their, their, you know, their demand as, as a developer. Um, so let me, can I launch into this? Um, this, was, this was a book that we did for a little bit of reflection, but this was the book that I did just for their penthouses. Because the penthouses on their own, I think there were seven or eight of them that we want that they wanted us to focus on, and they wanted to, um, which was really about two hundred and fifty million dollars worth of, of real estate just in the penthouses. So this was a book targeted at. Well, they wanted a brochure. Of course, I'm not going to give them a brochure. And this is actually, I would say, a very. Um, it's almost related to the Tribeca project because it it does kind of open up. It's, it's as well. However, you see that it, it has, um, you know, there's a spine to it, um, but let's, let's open a page and see what happens. Well, first of all, what you see, well, let me take this. This acts as a spine, okay? It's a piece of plastic and it keeps it together, all right? So you can open up this book anywhere and, you know, there you are. You see a picture, the Manhattan skyline and the building, okay? And what happens though is when you take away this, plastic spine okay because this acts as the spine then this book actually opens up and unlike the Miyaki one now it doesn't have a spine so if you open this up it's maybe it's like 15 meters long so it's it's a book that then you know starts to open up this way and it doesn't have a spine to fall back on now okay so what we wanted was the salespeople to put this on you know, an enormously large table and seduce the, the people who were potential buyers with the kind of beautiful photography that we were part of. Um, the, you know, the people had a feeling and immersion into the building. Um, the glam, you know, it's a lot, listen, this is a lot of New York glamour here, okay, and a, and a, a lot of money involved. But um, I want to take you to the end where, you know, we're getting through this and, you um, all of a sudden, there's the client who says, oh, can I look at um, the floor plan? And basically, yes, you can. The floor plan is embedded into the book. You know, unlike most floor plans where they're floating and they're a separate item, this one is intact. And then you get to the duplex penthouse, which basically it's a double, which I, I can't even open this for you, but basically there are two floor plans in here with two floors that would open up. I, mean, I could try to do that, but I'm not sure I'll have much success. There's one here. There's one here. Fantastic. So, uh, it's um, great. Fisher, I'm so pleased to see that. I have wanted to see it for years. So it's wonderful. Again, that's that is beautiful. amazing. You know, it's not a random selected graphic. That is the floor plate of the building itself, which I thought was so beautiful and pure with these Bayview windows. And um, yeah. Extraordinary, extraordinary. The vendor hated us. <laughs> <laughs> they, they had to create these special wooden jigs so that the people who were, you know, there are probably like 20 individual sheets of paper there that have to be, perfectly glued together underside, on the underside. And if you mess it up, it's not going to be straight. So a lot of risk. Yeah. Look, I, I, I think we really will have to close because of time. And, and I, 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 I just really want to express, I think, what we started with the COVID thing and we started with the challenges that presented. But I hope the audience, like me, has had this wonderful insight into two people who supported each other through that. And the, the exchange that we've had together today gives us that window into how you would have conversed and how you would have written to each other from Milan to Australia and back and forth. And that deep 
sense of creative camaraderie and 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 being that you you both share from the time that you first met so many years ago up until the present day it's been an absolute honor to hear you go through some of those wonderful exchanges to see the extraordinary work and to hear um, about some of the, the colorful history that is our collective history of design so it's it's um, been an absolute honor and a privilege um, so thank you both and I think if, if I can, I would just like to close um, by acknowledging Mama and Monash University Department of Design for providing us this forum and this opportunity. Um, and what's exciting is that Vision is coming to Melbourne for Design Week and we'll have that opportunity. Vision is not only um, attending the exhibition where her work will be on display, but she's also doing a, a talk for the Robin Boyd Foundation and she's also doing a talk at the new Shepparton Art Museum in Shepparton, the Denton Corporate Marshall Building. So there'll be ample opportunities for people to catch up with Vishnu and, and we do hope that we are bumping into each other at events in part of the extraordinary Melbourne Design Week 2022. So I thank you all and bid you farewell. <laughs>